Hello, everybody. Uh, it's uh, 10.45, so we're going to get uh, uh, started. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to be co-chairing this session with uh, Dr. Patricia Rocco from uh, Brazil, who I've gotten to know, uh, uh, had the pleasure of getting to know much better over the, uh, the course of this week. Um, and uh, so we have a very exciting session today on the issue of diaphragm dysfunction, which I think is uh, um, an overlooked, but I think now increasingly emphasized uh, um, area of, of mechanical ventilation to, uh, where there's, I think, a real potential to potentially impact patient outcomes if we're more sophisticated with our, uh, our attention, I guess, our monitoring and, our, and potentially think about how treatments that we routinely employ might, might impact that. And uh, I think a lot of the attention on this talk has been thanks to several of the inv uh, investigators who are scheduled to speak here today. Um, so without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Leo Hunks who's going to talk about uh, pathophysiology of diaphragm dysfunction. So thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, uh, Jeremy, Patricia, um, and for the invitation to speak here. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, I'm going to give a kind of introduction talk about the pathophysiology of diaphragm dysfunction in ICU patients. So these are my disclosures. I don't think anything related to the current presentation. And this is the respiratory muscle pump. And the most important muscle for inspiration, obviously, is the diaphragm. But when the load imposed on the diaphragm increases, accessory inspiratory muscles or even the expiratory muscles may be recruited. And as you are sitting here in this room, you're healthy, your maximum inspiratory pressure is around 100 centimeters of water. Well, for tidal breathing, you need a pressure, you need to generate a pressure of five, six centimeters of water. So we do have a huge reserve capacity. But still, respiratory muscle weakness is a clinically relevant problem in our patients. This is a great study published many years ago by Samir Chabert, and he shows that after three, four days of controlled mechanical ventilation, the pressure generating capacity of the diaphragm is decreased by 25%. So you lose function really, really rapidly. And this is a very important study by the group from Alexander de Moel, actually measuring diaphragm function at the day of ICU admission. And look what's happening here. So this is a control group. These are patients admitted to the ICU. And in quite a large group of patients, diaphragm weakness was present at the day of ICU admission. So this is not ventilator-induced diaphragm dysfunction. These patients were on the ventilator just for a couple of hours. But the interesting thing they found, that the degree of diaphragm, the severity of diaphragm dysfunction, was independently associated with sepsis. So maybe there is a role for inflammation or infection. This is another important study from the same group, where they assessed respiratory muscle or diaphragm function at the time of weaning, at the time of the first spontaneous breathing trial. And they reported 63% of the patients at that time a diaphragm weakness. And very important, 42% of these patients did not have peripheral muscle weakness. So quite some patients may have severe diaphragm weakness, but intact peripheral muscle weakness or the other way around. They also nicely show that there is an association between diaphragm weakness and prolonged mechanical ventilation. So yes, your diaphragm becomes weak really rapidly, and it has a clinical implication. I would like to focus on what is actually happening in the diaphragm in our patient. And this is a, well, very important a landmark study where the group of Sanford Levine took biopsies of the diaphragm of brain-dead patients that had been on the ventilator for two, three days. And he was the first to report severe muscle fiber atrophy. So only after a couple of days of mechanical ventilation, atrophy of the diaphragm develops. But an important maybe limitation of this study is that it is a very specific group of patients, brain-dead patients. So in these studies, what we wanted to do is look at changes in the diaphragm of real ICU patients. So these were patients admitted to the ICU on mechanical ventilation and at some point in time had a clinical indication for laparotomy or thoracotomy, which allowed us to take a biopsy 
of the diaphragm. What the studies are going to show, the mean duration of ventilation was somewhere around two and a half, three days. So we could confirm that atrophy developed in these patients as we compared it to elective surgery patients that had not been on the ventilator at all, only for one or two hours for the surgery. So yeah, we report for both slow twitch and fast twitch fibers, there is diaphragm muscle atrophy. But interestingly, and what was not reported in the data from Levine, is that we reported increased number of inflammatory cells, macrophages, neutrophils, and other inflammatory cells. And when we looked at the ultrastructural level, electron microscopy, right here, this is a control, elective surgery patient, you will recognize the normal striation of the muscle. But this is a typical ICU patient. The architecture of the muscle is, at some points, completely destroyed. So we call that sarcomeric disruption, and it's important because this is not something that is consistent with just inactivity. More recently, Huashi described, also in diaphragm biopsies of ICU patients, increased fibrosis. So there's an increase in volume of the extracellular matrix in critically ill patients as compared to controls. And why is that important? It helps us think about it. Because if you do assess thickness of the diaphragm but ultrasound, maybe thickness is maintained, but atrophy of muscle fibers may have developed, but because there is increase in extracellular matrix, the total distance, the total thickness of the muscle does not change. And that's actually what we have confirmed. So in the next study, also in diaphragm biopsies, we looked at contraction of muscle fibers. So really at the muscle fiber level. That's shown here. So with increasing calcium concentrations, control fibers generate a certain amount of force. This force is much lower in ICU patients. So there's something happening at the ultrastructural level. And what we thought was very interesting, that the fibers were less sensitive to calcium. And that's interesting because we do have a drug, Levosimenden, that improves calcium sensitivity. I don't have the time to go into that, but we're actually doing a large randomized controlled trial now to see if that improves weaning from mechanical ventilation. And now, and I realize this is Friday morning, and you probably had a fantastic night yesterday in Brussels, but now I'm going to dive really deep into physiology. These are new, not published data, but I think they are really excited, but I may be a little bit biased here. And this is about muscle hibernation. I think that you know hibernation or stunning from cardiac muscle. After cardiac ischemia, the, the, the myocardium goes in the face of stunning. What's that? So this is normal muscle physiology. Right here, myosin molecule, actin, a muscle contraction develops when the myosin head binds to actin and as a kind of power stroke, allowing the muscle to shorten. It's happening right here, and with ATP, with energy, the myosin head detaches from the muscle again, right? That's shown here again, actin, myosin backbone, myosin head, and this is the normal contraction, so it attaches to actin. But with stunning or hibernation, the myosin head is actually very close to the myosin backbone. And that does not allow contraction. And this is an energy-saving state. So this is the idea of hibernation of a muscle. The myosin head is very close to the myosin backbone. So hibernation has been reported previously in myocardium, ischemia. And it's a physiological mechanism. When there's metabolic stress, you want to reduce energy consumption in the muscle. The muscle goes into this hibernation or super relaxed state. And we were interested to see if this happens in the diaphragm as well. So we again took biopsies of, I think this was 54 patients on the ventilator again for two and a half, three days, and compared it to actually controls 
And this is really, really complicated. I mean, what you're actually doing right here, again, is looking at the distance between this myosin head and the actin molecule. It's done with a so-called synchrotron. It's a very complicated something. You shoot electrons into the muscle fibers, but you have to believe me here, otherwise you need to read the paper in a couple of weeks, I hope. But the first thing that we report, that the difference between the actin and myosin molecule in itself is not different. That's important. But what we actually confirmed is that, on average, the distance between the myosin head and the actin is higher in ICU patients. And this is consistent, there's a lot of additional experiments, but this is consistent with a hibernation state of the diaphragm in ICU patients. So there are less myosin heads available. They are still there, but they are less available for contraction. And the exciting thing also is that we did not find that in peripheral muscles. So this is something that appears to be, at least at that time, very specific for the diaphragm. So to conclude this part, what happens in the diaphragm of ICU patients? Yes, atrophy. There's injury, inflammation, fibrosis, reduced force generating capacity, reduced calcium sensitivity, and there's hibernation. And the interesting thing is it happens, at least in our experiment, it seems to happen earlier than in non-respiratory muscles. So if we summarize diaphragm dysfunction in ICU patients, Yes, there is a role probably for inactivity, consistent with the atrophy that is observed. There's probably a role for load-induced injury. Part of the destruction we see, the changes we see in the diaphragm, may be the result of high activity. Maybe there's a role for metabolic stress. Again, the metabolic stress may be an explanation for this hibernation state. And there's two other factors that I would like to uh, touch brief upon. And that is the role of PEEP and the role of eccentric contractions. So first thing, with higher level of PEEP, the position of the diaphragm, the geometry of the diaphragm changes. As you can see here, a patient in MRI with higher levels, so I think this was two of PEEP versus 15 of PEEP, the diaphragm moves downward, and the important thing is the zone of apposition becomes shorter. It's shown right here in this schematic. So with higher levels of PEEP, the zone of apposition, where tension is developed, becomes shorter. That's not a major issue when the patient is on the ventilator, right? You just give a little bit more of a cyst. This is data from an animal experiment. So these animals were ventilated with higher levels of PEEP for a certain period of time, and then we measured the length of the diaphragm fibers. What we indeed found is that after a certain period of ventilation with PEEP, the diaphragm becomes shorter. The diaphragm becomes shorter because sarcomeres are lost. So it's really a structural modification here. And you say, well, why worry about this? Well, this is, I have to be honest, this is a hypothesis. It's something we're working on, but look right here. So this is the diaphragm without PEEP, normal distance between sarcomeres. Now we increase PEEP, so the diaphragm becomes shorter. But at some point, muscle has plasticity, right? The muscle adapts. So. In this case, one of the circumits is expelled, so there's, an, again, an optimal length. It's a normal physiological adaptation. But now the problem is, you are doing the spontaneous breathing trial, PEEP is lost, and the muscle is overstretched. So our idea is that maybe in some patients, spontaneous breathing fail, trial fails because of this phenomenon. And the last thing, eccentric injury, and this is a paper just published a couple of days ago in the Blue Journal, where we actually reported that in patients on the ventilator, the diaphragm is developing force during expiration, resulting in 
what is was called eccentric contractions, which are actually lengthening activations. So there's expiration, but the diaphragm is active, which results in lengthening activations. And this may be, I'm not sure yet, but this may be another mechanism for diaphragm injury. So to conclude, I think there's a lot going on in the diaphragm of our ICU patients. There are structural modifications. There's myofiber atrophy, both reduction in cross-sectional area and changes in length. We have signs of injury. We have signs of fibrosis, signs of hibernation of the diaphragm. There are functional modifications. It's weakness, weakness due to atrophy. It's a reduction of specific force, reduced calcium sensitivity. What is the pathophysiology? Well, I think it's the proposed pathophysiology. Maybe, probably, there's a role for disuse. Maybe there's a role for high loading. Maybe there's a role for metabolic stress and eccentric injury. And I'll leave you with that. Thank you. That was a fantastic uh, presentation, Leo. Uh, uh, so impressive, uh, the, the work you're doing. Uh, does anybody in the audience have any, any questions? Oh, sorry, Laurent. Uh, uh, Leo, thank you very much. Real, brilliant overview. Many questions. Uh, one quick one is, does hibernation mean it's reversible? And, and, and does it mean it's always reversible? That's a very good question. We know from cardiac muscle that it is reversible, right? Everyone will recognize that there is a period that there is stunning of the myocardium, but after some time, function improves. Whether this is reversible in the diaphragm, we don't know, honestly speaking. I would think it's the same phenomenon as happens in the myocardium, so at some point it will be reversible. And, and in the paper, we have a lot of additional experiments that this has to do with phosphorylation of some parts of the, uh, of the myosin head. So probably this is something that we can modulate if we want to, but still the question is, I mean, this state of hibernation is a physiological phenomenon. It protects the diaphragm at some point. So honestly speaking, I'm not sure if we should actually reverse this at a point that the diaphragm is under high stress, high levels of inflammation. But we have learned from cardiac muscle that it is reversible, yes. Thank you very much, Leo. Alex, uh, Alex de Moule. So I, I have a, a question like related to hibernation. Um, um, so if, if we assume that this uh, hibernation is, is kind of protective, uh, should we respect it? Uh, or, 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 and, and is it dangerous to challenge the diaphragm and do everything uh, we do usually to make the diaphragm contracting? Yeah. I think that's an excellent question, and, and honestly speaking, I don't know. I mean, this is data that are now under review for a journal. Um, these are the questions that the reviewers had as well. I think it's just the first point here. This is the first data to show that hibernation happens at all in the diaphragm, and that it's present in ICU patients. I think we need many years to come if it's something that we should aim for to reverse or not. Maybe not. Maybe we should just give it the time until inflammation is gone, metabolic stress is gone, and the diaphragm will, well, this, this hibernation will reverse by itself. But maybe, and it will be part of the paper, we do have some strategies to reverse this, um, this hibernation. But if it's a good idea in our patients, I don't know at this point. If I can ask uh, one question, uh, I, I think the, the analogy with the uh, cardiovascular system is, is very intriguing. And one of the, one of the other areas that I uh, was wondering if maybe you could touch on is the, the issue of demand ischemia potentially being at play, especially in, in addition to inflammation, you know, endothelial dysfunction and, and uh, microcircuitory dysfunction in these patients and uh, organ, the diaphragm that uh, has incredibly high oxygen demand if the patients are forcefully making uh, respiratory efforts. So I wonder if, if that might be yet another mechanism that could be driving this. Yeah, that, that is an interesting question. And we've been thinking about it. I, you know, the problem with the heart is you'd only have two coronary arteries, right? If, you have an, if I have an occlusion of my left coronary artery right now, I'm going to be in major problems. The diaphragm is different. There's so much collateral perfusion. There's so many arteries perfusing the diaphragm that I think that this occlusion of an artery will not be the problem, but I think it's a fantastic uh, 
hypothesis whether this plays a role or not. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, Liu. I like it very, very much, your presentation. Thank you. And um, we are working in this point uh, related to the mitochondria. And uh, this is one important point because the sepsis in induced diaphragmatic dysfunction per se. And you have uh, some important changes in mitochondria function. So it's not only the fibrotic process that we have to deal with, but we have to deal with the oxygen consumption yes. uh, during the whole process. And when we start to combine the mechanical ventilation that is not protective with a higher PEEP. So uh, uh, this is a, what's your take home message related uh, to the future, you know, of sepsis associated with this mechanical ventilation focus on the diaphragm? Because this is a very important point. It, yeah, thank you. <laughs> That's a good question. Well, the first thing is, um, you may know, we had a paper in the Blue Journal a couple of years ago about mitochondrial function in the diaphragm of ICU patients. And we really, really did the best we could to report mitochondrial dysfunction, because that was what we were expecting, that has been shown in animal models. But all the tests we did, we could not report any mitochondrial dysfunction in the diaphragm of these patients. I mean, this was biochemistry, functional assessment, even electron microscopy. There was nothing wrong with the mitochondria, which was really, really unexpected. So, Great. like mitochondria, I don't know the whole answer to what we have to do. I don't know, maybe, maybe you is going to give the answer in the diaphragm protective <laughs> ventilation. So I'm going to give, I'm not sure. And uh, you know, this is, this is really hard about thinking uh, what, what now the, the answer is. And I don't think there is one strategy. I mean, the very nice paper published by Alexander de Moule that these patients already have diaphragm dysfunction when they are admitted to the ICU, probably related to inflammation. So it's not just a ventilator. It's all the factors that play an important role as well. Um, fantastic, fantastic, Liu. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. So let's move forward. And I'd like to invite uh, <laughs> Professor Ivan Gollinger. My pleasure that you are here. And uh, he's from Toronto in Canada, and he'll talk about the diaphragm protective ventilation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's really a pleasure to participate in, uh, in a really outstanding session. And uh, thank you, Professor Hunks, for that, uh, that lecture, because that really sets us up beautifully to start thinking about what do we actually do to, uh, to protect the diaphragm. Um, these, these are my uh, disclosures. Uh, slides advance here. It's hibernating. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> All right, now it's working. I, I do want to emphasize, I will uh, very briefly mention diaphragm neurostimulation. I do receive uh, research support and, and consulting fees from uh, a number of companies that uh, are developing diaphragm neurostimulation techniques. Um, so, <clears throat> Well, uh, hibernation is very new and exciting and did not make it into this uh, figure that from a paper published a few years ago. Um, you know, the kind of overarching mechanistic framework that informs a diaphragm protective approach uh, reflects the kind of various mechanisms that uh, Professor Hunks summarized. You know, the issue of disuse over assistance resulting in, in atrophy, uh, potentially under assistance leading to excess loading and muscle injury, the eccentric myotrauma, um, uh, that uh, can result from the eccentric loading that uh, was described, as well as this idea of expiratory myotrauma, where the uh, diaphragm is maintained at excessively short length for a prolonged period of time, resulting in muscle shortening. So I don't have any clinical trial data to present to you about, uh, about how uh, the diaphragm should be protected. Uh, as I'll note at the end, that's what we're working on now. So really what this will be is a, a kind of conceptual approach based on emerging physiological data, and I'm going to move pretty quickly because I have a number of, of uh, recent and uh, uh, recent studies and also uh, some unpublished data to present. So the first step in protecting the diaphragm, at least from the standpoint of, of uh, the ventilation associated injury, is to monitor its activity because 
insufficient loading and excessive or dyssynchronous loading seems to be so critical to uh, the development of injury, um, it's crucial to, to actually monitor the activity of the muscle. And there's a, a wide range of monitor, monitoring techniques, as you know, but uh, I think what's recently come to light is that there now are a couple of extremely useful, very simple and well-validated non-invasive uh, techniques for monitoring. Uh, so there's the P0.1 or the airway occlusion pressure that many people are familiar with and uh, becoming more well-known, but maybe not as widely familiar as the, the PIOC maneuver, the expiratory hold, to measure the expiratory occlusion pressure, which uh, allows you to assess the magnitude of respiratory effort. And this uh, very nice paper published in anesthesiology last year by uh, Leo Hunk's group demonstrated that uh, both the PIOC and the P0.1, very simple non-invasive maneuvers are are very useful to detect you know, insufficient diaphragmatic effort during assisted ventilation. And the PIOC maneuver was also relatively good at detecting excessive diaphragmatic effort during mechanical ventilation. So these techniques uh, are really, I think, coming into their own as simple non-invasive maneuvers that can be applied easily and regularly at the bedside to monitor closely the activity of the diaphragm. So having monitored it, the next challenge is to actually get the muscle contracting at the right level. And granted, as was just discussed, there are questions about the appropriate time to initiate diaphragm contraction and whether it's uh, safe and effective to have the diaphragm contracting from the very outset of, of respiratory failure. But before we can answer a question like that, we need to see, can we actually get the patient breathing while also avoiding excess uh, diaphragmatic effort? And so the the goal really in, in uh, uh, approaching or initiating diaphragm protective ventilation is first of all to get the patient uh, brain breathing more frequently than the ventilator. So until the patient's intrinsic neural respiratory rate exceeds that of the ventilator, uh, they will uh, not trigger or they'll develop kind of intermittent reverse triggering. Um, and so it's crucial to wean sedation. And in the session earlier about sedation, we emphasized that opioids in particular, because they specifically depress respiratory rate, uh, are a barrier to getting patients breathing under the ventilator. So prioritizing the weaning of opioids appears to be important. Uh, to, and then also reducing the, the rate on the ventilator to avoid unnecessary passive hyperventilation. And then once the patient is breathing, uh, the challenge is to titrate the ventilator and the sedation to achieve what we think, and again, this is hypothesis-based uh, uh, approach at this point, are appropriate uh, levels of respiratory effort. So not too much loading, uh, and not too little, uh, sort of a Goldilocks uh, concept for mechanical ventilation. So the question is, can we titrate the ventilator settings and the sedation to achieve optimal effort? So we set out to answer that question in uh, a phase one trial called the Landmark Trial. Um, and uh, I won't go through the details of the algorithm here, but suffice to say that this idea of progressively adjusting the ventilator to and the sedation to achieve optimal effort is complicated because you have to think not only about uh, the level of diaphragm contraction, but also the lung descending pressure to the, ensure that you're maintaining lung protection and also, of course, maintain respiratory homeostasis. So it's a what I call a three-dimensional challenge. And so we put together this algorithm, which we tested in this clinical study. So we enrolled uh, 30 patients, 14 of whom were uh, not on ECMO. And what's notable at baseline is that at the time of enrollment, these were patients with moderate or severe acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. None of the patients were breathing. So the diaphragm was quiescent in all cases. But what happened after we reduced the sedation and the respiratory rate on the ventilator to get the patient breathing is that they all transitioned from no effort to very high levels of effort. And very few patients were sort of in the optimal target range. And after you know, effort, applying the algorithm to it, uh, achieve uh, optimal effort levels by titrating ventilation sedation, we could only have kind of moderate success rates, uh, which was, you know, uh, we, we got some further control by using partial neuromuscular blockade. Interestingly, in patients on ECMO, uh, who constituted the other uh, half of the studied cohort, again, all of them were uh, not breathing at the time of enrollment, uh, but after initiating uh, uh, spontaneous breathing, many of them had excess effort, but because the sweep gas flow on ECMO is such a powerful mechanism for controlling respiratory drive, we had much higher uh, success rates in these patients. So uh, just highlighting the potential advantage of ECMO for controlling uh, diaphragm activity.
And in this study, this is uh, data that's just uh, uh, been accepted for publication, uh, we, we show that uh, two physiological parameters, the ventilatory ratio, which is a surrogate for dead space, and the uh, respiratory system elastance, uh, which of course reflects the mechanical impairment, these two parameters interacted to determine how high the patient's effort and lung distending pressure would be after initiating spontaneous breathing. So you can see that patients with a higher ventilatory ratio and patients with a higher elastance in the top right here had very high levels of respiratory um, effort and lung distending pressure, which starts to give us a sense of which patients is it gonna be possible to have safe spontaneous breathing in and which patients is it gonna be more challenging. Now, in addition to doing this clinical study, we took a computational approach where we developed a mathematical model of uh, respiratory control under mechanical ventilation. Um, and this mathematical model integrates uh, mechanics, gas exchange, um, uh, acid-base homeostasis, and um, uh, kind of what's known from first principles about uh, uh, brainstem respiratory control. And uh, we basically um, applied this, this kind of, you can think of it as a, a assisted ventilation or assisted breathing simulator in a hypothetical population of patients with uh, respiratory failure. They had um, physiological characteristics uh, ca consistent with those uh, in, seen in uh, patients with acute respiratory failure. And then we tested this simulator to see if we could achieve our lung and diaphragm protective targets. And you can see that again, um, in the, whether in pressure support mode or in PAV plus, um, you had, you know, again, only modest success rates. And the addition of ECOR substantially increased the, the, uh, su the, um, the uh, success in this in silico trial. And uh, interestingly, ECOR alone, without either ventilation or sedation, had a very low success rate, which raises questions about the feasibility of the awake, awake ECMO concept in ARDS. And I should say that this simulator uh, validated nicely in terms that the, the, uh, the predicted results uh, matched exactly with the observed results in our, in our uh, clinical trial, uh, as, as shown here, which I'll go through, pass over for the sake of time. So in this figure here, what we took is we took these 5,000 simulated patients. We, um, again, applied a machine learning technique to, and which demonstrated that ventilatory ratio and elastance were the two major determinants of success. And when you stratify the patients by a simple score where you add VR and ERS together, what you see is that you can essentially predict in this in silico trial which patients are going to achieve uh, safe spontaneous breathing. And the blue bars here, the higher the score is, the lower the, the chance. And what's striking is that uh, the addition of ECOR substantially increases the probability of achieving targets in most of these patients. So what this is suggesting is that maybe we can use this, a simple score like this, these physiological parameters to say which patients are gonna need adjunctive techniques to achieve uh, safe diaphragm activation during mechanical uh, ventilation. And what are those adjunctive techniques? Well, extracorporeal CO2 removal, obviously potentially one, but that's obviously a very aggressive, costly invasive intervention just to optimize spontaneous breathing. So um, another potential and exciting uh, intervention is this idea of diaphragm neural stimulation. And there's gonna be a couple more lectures about this, so I'll only touch on it very briefly. But the idea here is that if a patient is too sick to be allowed to breathe spontaneously, perhaps we can take control of the level of diaphragm activity more directly by stimulating the diaphragm. And here in this paper last year, we described an on-demand de on technique using a transvenous uh, phrenic nerve stimulation system. And what you can see here is that these are the tracings of the mechanical ventilator. So you can see the action of the ventilator here. And then uh, you can see here the uh, transdiaphragmatic pressure. Um, and with, uh, with each uh, ventilator delivered breath, the stimulator automatically uh, stimulates the phrenic nerve and makes the diaphragm contract. And when the system is turned off, the patient's um, activity disappears, confirming that the patient's actually not breathing under mechanical ventilation. This is just the effect of diaphragm neural stimulation. And this, uh, the results of our 20 patient phase one trial are, are in preparation, but just uh, to highlight the um, potential impact of a technique like this, uh, shown here on the, on the left is the respiratory drive hour by hour. Uh, measured by P0.1, and this, of course, is it, it, the way that our system worked. If the patient wasn't breathing, the P0.1 would be zero, even though we were stimulating the diaphragm because it was the ventilator's effort that activated the system. 
So you can see here in red the duration of time in each patient when the drive was absent and therefore when ordinarily the, uh, without pacing the diaphragm would also be inactive. But in the presence of this on-demand pacing system, you can see that the diaphragm is maintained active nearly the entire time. So this offers us the potential to end the problem of diaphragm inactivity, and whether or not, of course, that improves patient outcomes and, and what that means in the context of issues like load-induced injury and hibernation uh, needs further study. But uh, an exciting uh, potential intervention to further control the diaphragm. Now, just very briefly in the time left to me, I want to emphasize the issue that, that Professor Hunks raised about expire, expiratory myotrauma because I think we have some new data that really highlights the importance of this. So this uh, figure here is from, is from the same slide that Professor Hunks showed from his group's work where they demonstrated that the many patients have this uh, negative elastic work or negative power. Uh, it, uh, patients in the ICU typically have much higher values than what is seen in healthy subjects, highlighting the presence of diaphragm activity and activation uh, beyond uh, the inspiratory phase. And we studied this in a cohort of uh, uh, close to 50 mechanically ventilated patients where we recorded uh, diaphragm electrical activity on an hourly basis for up to seven days and quantified the level of um, post-inspiratory effort using, using the EDI technique. So what you see here in this figure is um, a series of breaths where there's very high effort and premature cycling and pressure support. And uh, um, the ventilator cycles off at the, at the gray line, just uh, approximately timing with the peak effort. And the end of the neural inspiratory phase indicated by the red line is approximately 60% of peak. So between the peak EDI and, and the red line, the patient's essentially making efforts during inspiratory effort as the ventilator's already cycled into the expiratory phase resulting in this very odd expiratory flow tracing here, where you see the, the, the flow getting pulled back up in the expiratory phase early on. Uh, and this really is rec represents the mechanical effects of uh, post-inspiratory loading or expiratory diaphragm activity. And in this paper, we measured uh, neuromuscular coupling, which is uh, a, a means of assessing the performance of the diaphragm, the ratio of transdiaphragmatic pressure to EDI. The higher the coupling, kind of the more efficient or effective the performance of the diaphragm is, and looked at the, the rate of change in neuromuscular coupling over time as a function of exposure to these different loading conditions. And what I expected to see was that, you know, very high levels of loading would be associated with a progressive decline in neuromuscular coupling over time. But in fact, it, it's doesn't, it doesn't even reach significance. But if anything, the relatively more prolonged exposure to um, elevated inspiratory loading was uh, possibly a, uh, correlated to a trend uh, for increased neuromuscular coupling over time. And the average daily magnitude of inspiratory loading wasn't associated with neuromuscular coupling over time. By contrast, uh, the, um, the duration of exposure to post-inspiratory loading conditions was associated with a progressive decline in neuromuscular coupling that was strongly significant. And similarly, the, the median hourly magnitude of post-inspiratory loading was correlated to a decline in neuromuscular coupling. So these data suggest that ex prolonged exposure to these expiratory diaphragm activity or post-inspiratory loading conditions may contribute to diaphragm weakness during mechanical ventilation. And so avoiding or preventing post-inspiratory loading becomes a critical priority for uh, a diaphragm protective approach. So what kinds of factors uh, during uh, mechanical ventilation contributed? Well, dyssynchrony is clearly a major reason why the diaphragm would be contra contracting during the expiratory phase. And just to highlight two examples here, both reverse triggering during controlled ventilation and breath stacking were associated with an, a marked increase in uh, post-inspiratory loading. And interesting to correlate the, 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 these results with those of a recent uh, preclinical work by Takeshi Yoshida's group, where they showed that uh, um, exposure to uh, breath stacking dyssynchrony or reverse triggering dyssynchrony was associated with significant increase in abnormal uh, uh, area fraction of muscle suggesting injury associated with those uh, forms of dyssynchrony. So uh, kind of circumstantial correlations suggesting that indeed such dyssynchronies may be contributing to diaphragm weakness in our patients. And it's possible that a mode like NAVA where you achieve better expiratory synchrony may reduce the magnitude of, of uh, muscle injury and dysfunction.
uh, as uh, based on work uh, from Robbie Kamani's group. So to sum up, uh, um, put it all together, uh, you know, the emerging concept of, uh, of diaphragm protective ventilation, not yet evidence-based, but I think emerging based on, on the evidence that we have from physiology is first of all that close monitoring is, is a critical priority and we now can do this quite easily with these non-invasive techniques. We want to try and initiate safe diaphragm activation at the earliest opportunity. Uh, so we want to avoid inactivity pr to prevent atrophy, but probably important to um, avoid injurious activity and in particular potentially this expiratory dyssynchrony or post-inspiratory loading. When the patient has uh, severely deranged elastins or dead space, these may be the patients who need adjunctive therapies like neurostimulation to achieve safe diaphragm activation. And as I suggested, maintaining expiratory synchrony may be uh, critical uh, to achieving diaphragm protective ventilation. And, and you can already do that at the bedside by going and looking at the waveforms, examining the expiratory flow tracing and looking for evidence of, uh, of that uh, post-inspiratory activation. Um, we are testing a preliminary approach to diaphragm protective ventilation based on the insights we learned in the Landmark 1 trial. Now in the Landmark 2 trial, which is part of the um, invasive mechanical ventilation domain in uh, the practical platform trial. So if you're interested to learn more about that trial, you can, you can go to our website. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ivan. Questions from the audience? Everyone's in hibernation. Oh, but I have one. Uh, in your study, do you have ob obese patients? And uh, if you have, do you think that the behavior should be completely different? You know, I have to say we didn't specifically look at, at obesity in our, our trial. It might be interesting to go back and, and look at the data. I wouldn't necessarily expect, you know, the behavior to be fundamentally different, you know, yeah. respiratory control. You know, if a patient has obesity hypoventilation syndrome, different story. But otherwise, you know, the kind of responsiveness to ventilation and sedation may not be systematically different. Um, but, you know, certainly those patients may have mechanical characteristics that yes, increase the yeah. work of breathing. And uh, so I uh, could present a challenge from that point of view. Thank you. Thank uh, Leah. Do we have a microphone by chance? Sir. Thank you very much, uh, Ewan, for this uh, brilliant presentation. You're stressing the importance of early activation of the diaphragm by reducing sedation, or if that doesn't work, maybe by diaphragm pacing. When looking at this whole problem for a little bit more time, and looking at our histology work, I'm getting more and more doubt whether it's a very good idea in the early stages of patients with a septic shock to activate the diaphragm. Maybe we should just leave it alone for a moment. It, it feels a little bit like diaphragm pacing feels like dobutamine during a myocardial infarction. I mean, we have the kind of benefit of having ECMO for the diaphragm mechanical ventilation to allow okay. rest in a period of metabolic stress. So the early activation, diaphragm pacing in a very early stage, if we look at all the underlying pathophysiology, do you really think that this is the way to go? Mm -hmm. well, I think it's a very important point, and I think it's why we need to do clinical trials of these techniques rather than just to go ahead and start using them clinically, because we want to establish that this actually improves diaphragm function. Um, you know, I would say that the strongest evidence for the link between diaphragm injury during mechanical ventilation and um, patient outcome is, you know, really related to the issue of atrophy. You know, atrophy is you know, the most common thing that we've observed, um, at least from an ultrasound point of view, and I understand the limitations of that technique that you pointed out. But, you know, there's a very clear, strong association to, to poor outcome, and so I think, you know, Given the, the range of available evidence, preventing or limiting atrophy is an important therapeutic priority. And so I think the critical next thing is if, if a technique like neurostimulation proves to be feasible, then we need to do very carefully designed controlled trials to see, does should we activate earlier? Should we activate later? 
and uh, actually test, test this in the clinical setting. Because I agree with you, there's real reason for caution not to just go in and start hammering away at the, at the muscle. But the, the beauty of this neurostimulation technique is that you've got very tight control over the level of activation and you can, uh, you can even do very, very weak uh, activations that would, for example, prevent uh, the development of uh, kind of that pathway from inactivity to mitochondrial dysfunction. So, so um, lots to be studied. Uh, I still, if, is it time for a comment or not? Uh, unfortunately, I just, we probably should move on. I'm so sorry. Uh, if you want to do uh, go, 20 go, seconds. Go, yeah, go ahead. Well, uh, still, I'm not convinced that atrophy is such an important contributor. Of course, even if there's 20, 30 percent of atrophy of diaphragm muscle fibers. Again, we started out maximum inspiratory pressure is 100 centimeters of water. You require four, five, six, seven centimeters of water to generate normal alveolar ventilation. I really think that a lot of other factors are at play, and I'm really worried that, and you can say we can do the randomized controlled trials to see whether it works out or not, but first we have to agree and have to be sure that before we test something, there's a good physiological rationale, and it's not something that we're doing a large trial, I'm a little bit provocative here, and we conclude at the end we have increased diaphragm injury, and then I stand up, well, yeah, that's what I've expected. Yeah. Sorry, I'm a little bit provocative no, no, here, no. but I'm a little bit worried that we focus too much on the disuse and mm -hmm. disregard the data by Alexander, by other people mm -hmm. that show that there's a lot of other factors at play. Yeah, well, I, I, I completely understand, Leo. So, you know, when I'm talking about a controlled trial here, I'm talking about, you know, 20, 30 patients per arm where oh, we, sure. you know, have a very, in the endpoints are, you know, physiological measurements that will help us to detect the injury and dysfunction. So I completely understand and agree with your point. And I think that's why, but I think too, our field needs to think of uh, the clinical trial process as one where we, you know, have this kind of pipeline where we move from, from physiology and mechanism to very carefully rationalized preliminary trials that carefully work these things out, that give us confidence that we're doing things the right way. Um, be, because I agree with you, there are risks. Now, the, the finding that high effort levels was not associated with decline in neuromuscular coupling came as a big surprise to me. And um, so, you know, obviously that needs a lot, you know, corroboration, et cetera, but maybe is slightly reassuring on that front. But, sure. I, but I would also say that the outcome studies that are available s suggest a pretty strong link between atrophy and, and poor outcome. And whether that's causal or not is a different question, but uh, uh, you know, I think it motivates trying to prevent atrophy. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I'm so sorry. Thank you so much for that great uh, exchange. Appreciate it. All right, uh, since, so we have the discussion time built in, so I think we're actually uh, on track. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to introduce next uh, Dr. Jean-Christophe Richard uh, from France, who's here to uh, uh, answer this question for us about the role of uh, early spontaneous ventilation uh, with respect to diaphragm injury. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. So uh, we will discuss uh, early spontaneous ventilation and uh, uh, before that, uh, I have to declare my conflict of interest. I work in the University Hospital in Angers, and I share this working time with a lab in Air Liquid, where I uh, teach and accompany four young engineers for their PhD, working on research and innovation and ventilation. So uh, what I suggest is to start by uh, looking at uh, what we have to discuss this morning, which is uh, spontaneous breathing, which is very visible on the uh, pressure esophageal, uh, esophageal pressure tracing, available at the bedside on the screen of most of the ventilator uh, to date. Uh, this activity of the respiratory muscle is generating some assisted ventilation or spontaneous, spontaneous ventilation, depending of the way you will set the ventilator. And uh, again, it's very important to understand that uh, spontaneous ventilation is a result in one end of the activity of the respiratory muscle and in the other end of the seating of the ventilator. Um, uh, the question could be summarized uh, like this. Early spontaneous ventilation. Why, how, when, and how much? And we already understood with the two precedent speakers 
that the question of how much is something tricky uh, to, uh, to discuss. Um, uh, I, I think that uh, the why is relatively uh, easy to address. In fact, there is uh, evidence in the literature, physiological evidence, suggesting um, that uh, spontaneous ventilation may help to reduce and to preserve the diaphragmatic function. And we discussed that with uh, Leo and Johan before, but again, not so simple, because too much spontaneous ventilation may affect the diaphragm. The second benefit we can expect from spontaneous ventilation comes from the recruitment and the improvement of the gas exchange that results from uh, the mobilization of the diaphragm in the dependent part of the lungs. But again, not so simple because sometimes we can have some pendulum phenomenon that may affect an increased lung injury. And last, not least, not least, as previously suggested, to uh, improve uh, spontaneous ventilation, you have to consider to reduce sedation, and you may expect by reducing sedation uh, uh, to have less time under mechanical ventilation. Again, not so simple. Not so simple is not always the case, but. Aside this benefit of air, spontaneous ventilation, there is also some specific risk. The first one is what has been called patient self-inflicted lung injury. It's a vicious circle that comes from the swing of esophageal pressure due to the respiratory muscle that will generate more and more tidal volume and as a result, generate an increase of the respiratory drive, edema, and lung injury. This phenomenon uh, indicates that too much spontaneous ventilation may be harmful and should be uh, carefully uh, controlled or monitored. The second uh, important harmful effect you can expect or observe with spontaneous ventilation already mentioned by Johan in the preceding uh, 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 presentation, is the uh, breast tacking or double breast. Illustrated on this slide, you can see the effort on the esophageal pressure, and this breast tacking occurs when you set a relatively low tidal volume with a short inspiratory time. In that situation, you may have two successive inspiration uh, triggered by the, by the patient on the ventilator, and as a result, a double breath that will generate some injury due uh, of the large tidal volume induced by this breathtaking uh, uh, double breath. So uh, two um, uh, uh, side effects that are uh, commonly observed uh, with uh, uh, spontaneous ventilation when spontaneous ventilation is too much. So how can we manage the beneficial effect we expect of spontaneous ventilation while limiting the adverse effect? I think that something absolutely crucial is to well understand how to manage the ventilator to limit this risk of side effect. The first point on the ventilator I would like to discuss in this illustrated by this very old paper is uh, the difference between volume control and pressure control. On this slide, you have the work of breathing in different setting of volume or pressure assist control ventilation. You can see in that part of the, uh, of the slide that uh, during as volume assist control or pressure assist control, there is no difference of work of breathing when the inspiratory time is short. Short inspiratory time means relatively high inspiratory flow that cover the demand of the patient and that permit to control the work of breathing. But as mentioned previously, the risk of that situation is a short TI that remember may generate double breast breast tacking. If you want, if you have to limit the risk of breast tacking, you will have to increase the inspiratory time. 
And when you increase the inspiratory time in assist control ventilation, you will decrease the inspiratory flow. And decreasing the inspiratory flow will increase the work of breathing just because the demand of the patient will be higher than the flow delivered by the patient, generating a synchrony on high work of breathing. Interestingly, with pressure assist control, because of the decelerating flow, and also because the, the flow is free during pressure control, you may counteract and combine a relatively long TI on acceptable work of breathing. So uh, something suggesting that it could be a solution to optimize ventilation uh, uh, while permitting early spontaneous ventilation. So the, the, the second point I would like to stress regarding the seating of the ventilator is the point that uh, uh, is the, the, the concern of synchronization. If you synchronize the effort of the patient on the end, the breath delivered by the ventilator is good for synchrony, but it results in an increase in transpulmonary pressure that result in an increase in tidal volume. And if you consider early spontaneous ventilation, the risk of inspiratory um, uh, uh, synchronization is to definitely lose the control of the tidal volume, at least for a pressure mode of ventilation, uh, uh, as we discussed previously. Um, so uh, we discussed uh, years ago with uh, Laurent Brochard and Alain Merca, and we, uh, our, our reasoning was that, uh, okay, it could be interesting to combine uh, long protective ventilation and at a given time spontaneous breathing to use a pressure control mode of ventilation without inspiratory uh, synchronization to limit the risk of high transpulmonary pressure on high tidal volume and the possibility to breathe spontaneously either at the high level pressure on the low level pressure. So uh, for doing that, uh, we derive from the classical airway pressure release ventilation mode uh, by a customized mode using normal TI and not inverse e a ratio like uh, initially described with APRV. So again, a mode of pressure without synchronization and two levels of pressure, but very normal TI uh, with a target of, of uh, long protective ventilation with six milliliters per kilogram tidal volume. And interestingly, in a paper, we demonstrated that even if the spontaneous ventilation increased from the left to the right, the tidal volume, despite the pressure mode, was relatively well uh, maintained uh, between the target range of six uh, milliliters per kilogram, suggesting that it could be used with sedation to combine, again, lung protective and spontaneous ventilation. Uh, we run uh, years ago with uh, Laurent Brochard and Alain Merca on the group of REVA, randomized control studies on running uh, 700 patients randomized to be ventilated uh, with assist control ventilation or pressure control spontaneous ventilation, which is the name we call uh, the, the, the customized seating deriv derived from APRV we use and illustrated on the slide. This is PCSV with a normal TI. The plateau pressure was set at 30 centimeters of water, PIP, in order to maintain a 6 milliliter per kilogram tidal volume, and same for ACV. Uh, all and other things equal, uh, PIP sitting, winning of PIP, winning of mechanical ventilation, and uh, a protocol of sedation. What happened in uh, what we expect in that study in case of uh, um, spontaneous uh, breathing, spontaneous ventilation, you can see that spontaneous respiratory activity generate some uh, uh, um, change in the pressure trace with uh, PCSV without triggering the ventilator. 
uh, on some spontaneous ventilation superposed with the control ventilation while with assist control volume ventilation spontaneous activity tricks the breath and generated uh, uh, asynchrony and sometimes double breath or breath stacking. Uh, what, uh, let's look at uh, uh, the protocol for sedation to manage spontaneous ventilation, which again is a tricky point that we discussed previously. Uh, we have an algorithm uh, that according to the percentage of spontaneous ventilation permitted to adapt the sedation and sitting of the ventilator in case of uh, not, uh, uh, no, ventil no spontaneous ventilation or too much spontaneous ventilation. Um, uh, uh, so this is the algorithm and the target for spontaneous ventilation in that study was to reach 50% uh, uh, of total minute ventilation with spontaneous ventilation monitored by the ventilator, but no more than 50%. Uh, uh, let's look at the results. Uh, the, um, so the paper is uh, uh, submitted. Uh, this is the hospital mortality. There is absolutely no difference between the two groups in terms of hospital mortality. Uh, no difference in mortality uh, uh, at day 28, no difference in ventilatory free day, and no difference in organ failure free days. Interestingly, there was a significant huge difference in sedation in favor of the PCSV group. Uh, and, um, also, uh, less adjunctive therapy for hypoxia and also significant less uh, prone positioning with PCSV uh, in that uh, study. Um, so, uh, it looks like a little bit disappointing results, uh, even if uh, it demonstrates that it's perfectly uh, usable at the bedside to have a strategy based on this mode of ventilation with a specific algorithm for sedation. And uh, it's important to try to understand why the results are almost negative. And I think that a crucial uh, concern point uh, is uh, the uh, quantity, the amount of spontaneous ventilation reached by the patient uh, and illustrated on this slide. As you can see, the blue means less than 10% of spontaneous ventilation. It means that three days wa were needed to, re for, for, to reach uh, almost 50% of the patients on the wall uh, with uh, 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 sufficient uh, uh, amount of spontaneous ventilation. So uh, my, uh, my feeling is that uh, uh, the, the, the target of spontaneous ventilation uh, was reached uh, maybe too late uh, in, in that study. So uh, this is the interpretation or my uh, uh, takeaway message. Uh, benefit risk associated with spontaneous ventilation must be considered carefully, and this refers to the previous discussion, spontaneous ventilation depends on both the patient, including the sedation and, and clinical status, but also the ventilator. So this is something very important. Uh, pressure control spontaneous ventilation derived from APRV with no inspiratory synchronization may facilitate, may permit to uh, reduce sedation, to favor spontaneous ventilation without uh, too much asynchrony. And the optimal dosage amount of spontaneous ventilation is very difficult to reach, and its impact on outcome is uh, definitely not demonstrated at that time. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you for that excellent presentation and congrats on uh, very impressive uh, uh, trial results. Uh, any, any questions from the audience? If I can start by asking one maybe. Uh, in, the, uh, in the trial, I realize uh, um, these are just the, the sort of top line results, but I was wondering if uh, you've either tested or given any thought to potential subgroups uh, where, where you might anticipate a, a benefit. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Uh, uh, so we, we analyze, uh, in a postdoc analysis, we, we look at uh, a subgroup of patients uh, 
um, depending of their uh, severity of IRDS, but there was no signal in one group compared to the other. And uh, this is the only uh, postdoc analysis uh, we did uh, because this is the only uh, plane at the beginning and uh, we wait from uh, uh, the publication of the paper to, to try to look. Uh, um, because we try to look at the patient with more, much more spontaneous ventilation com compared to patients who do not reach spontaneous, uh, spontaneous level targeted initially. But we wait from uh, this uh, publication before looking at that. Uh. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, yeah, I think so <laughs> Thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Now we are going to do a, a minor modification, and uh, I would like to introduce uh, uh, Professor Laurent Blochat the, from the University of Toronto in Canada, and he'll talk about the neurostimulation beyond the diaphragm. Laurent? The Thank you so yours. much, uh, Patricia and Jeremy. And uh, this is a, a really a very exciting uh, session. So, and I'm going to briefly describe our experience with the one of the aspects which has been already mentioned, which is the stimulation of the phrenic nerve um, and the potential uh, applications. So, our laboratory is working with a number of companies. Uh, including um, one called Stimit, who is developing one of the stimulator, and I will uh, describe some data. We got some uh, research funds from, from this company. So I'm not going to go into details in something which has been discussed at length. Um, and there, I, I think the, the graphics is just showing that there are many reasons why the diaphragm may be injured. So reason uh, related to mechanical ventilation, uh, to the maybe the, the, the sepsis, maybe the denutrition, uh, and maybe the way the diaphragm is working. So we, we are not sure exactly, but what we see, and this was a, a very nice study by Martin Dress, is that, um, and these data have been shown in a different format by, by Leo, I think, um, is that if you look at the number of patients at the time of winning who have a low um, pressure under stimulation of the phrenic nerve, indicating diaphragm dysfunction. Um, you see this is 63% of patients, so very frequent patients with diaphragm dysfunction. At the time, they are supposed to use their diaphragm again in the, in the optimal way. And interestingly, that was, uh, that was much more frequent than limb muscle uh, weakness indicating if, uh, if needed, that uh, there is something different about the, the respiratory muscles. So, one of the reasons which we discussed and which is nicely uh, illustrated in this uh, review article by, uh, again, Martin Dress and Alexandre Moule and others, is to um, illustrate what, what we usually do with the diaphragm or the other muscle. Uh, when we breathe spontaneously, uh, we use our respiratory muscle. And I, I would say we, we, we talk of the diaphragm, but I, I think that's all the respiratory muscle, and there is much more than only the diaphragm. It's a very, very complex uh, interplay between different muscles to breathe. Uh, and we, when we put the patient sedated and artificially ventilated, uh, we stop everything. And, uh, and the respiratory muscles are like the heart. They're, they're, they are supposed to never stop. So th there is something really non-physiological here. Um, so that's why the idea of maybe stimulating the diaphragm at that time, so replacing what we do physiologically in a careful way, um, may have interesting effect in the ICU. And we had a discussion already. Um, but there is really interesting data out there, and, and I have to say the, the group of S Steve Reynolds had, had done fantastic work to demonstrate the feasibility of an approach where you could stimulate the diaphragm internally with a catheter, 
and the catheter would be inserted uh, through the jugular vein. So this is a, a pig, but um, the data now show that it's feasible in, in humans in the, exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. And because the catheter will cross uh, the mediastinum, uh, stimulating the two phrenic nerves is possible with two parts of the catheter. And in this um, proof of concept study, they showed in, uh, in animals which were ventilated for, as you can see, 60 hours of mechanical ventilation, uh, they could prevent diaphragm atrophy by constant stimulation of the phrenic nerve during that period. So, so it's feasible to stimulate the diaphragm while the, the animal, at least, is ventilated and to preserve the disuse atrophy, which uh, has been uh, so frequently described in, uh, in many models and also in humans. But the exciting part, I would say, uh, is that it's, it's not only the, the diaphragm that you may preserve. And of course, it makes sense because uh, spontaneous ventilation is related to uh, like suctioning the lung by the respiratory muscle, creating negative pressure around the lung. And as mentioned previously by uh, Jean-Christophe Richard, there are a lot of studies showing that spontaneous ventilation improve aeration of the lung, improve gas exchange. And again, in the same kind of model, uh, same group by Steve Reynolds, so showed that stimulating the diaphragm is very good for the lung. So that's the title, negative pressure assisted ventilation, lowers driving pressure and mechanical power in an ARDS model. That's really interesting because the, the fact that you have st the, the, the diaphragm or the uh, working uh, may do what we hope to do when, when we try to reopen the lung, but reopening with positive pressure is different than with negative pressure. And you have this effect on uh, decreasing, uh, improving the compliance, decreasing the driving pressure, and maybe all the effect of ventilator-induced lung injury could be prevented by stimulating the diaphragm. So that's, that's really exciting. And one of the effects of mechanical ventilation, which we don't understand very well, which has been uh, ignored for some time, is what is called now ventilator-associated brain injury. So, so it's not only for the, the pleasure of having a new acronym, uh, VABI, uh, but I think it, it makes sense that maybe there is something related to mechanical ventilation in the ICU and brain dysfunction, right? We have so many patients with delirium, we don't understand why, and we have so many patients who develop neurocognitive dysfunction. I know that sedation is a big confounder there, but it seems in experimental model that there is a specific effect of mechanical ventilation, uh, either through this uh, VILI effect which, uh, and the systemic effect, um, but what was uh, really fascinating in this work by Thiago Bassi was to show that if you stimulate the phrenic nerve again, you reduce the apoptosis of the cell in the hippocampus in the brain. Wow, that, that's, a, that's a big stretch, right? From our discussion about the muscle uh, and the stimulation, we now do something which is good for the brain needs a lot of confirmation, but really very exciting uh, finding. So in this context, it may be interesting to try to find the best way to stimulate the diaphragm, the best technique, and maybe be careful. I, I, I completely agree with the discussion we had before of not overstimulating. Um, it, it's possible to do it. So that was the very first uh, few patients uh, and uh, Yuan presented some of the data uh, done by Eden Morris, who is now in uh, Australia and who showed in, in very sick patients at the early phase, it's feasible to use the catheter and to stimulate the diaphragm uh, 
uh, you see the, the, the kind of tracings where you have uh, control uh, flow control ventilation. You have this stimulation uh, here in this breast. Um, you may say, well, it looks a bit like uh, uh, some kind of asynchrony, but at least you stimulate the diaphragm, it's feasible. We don't have any outcome data yet. And uh, so it, it may be possible to achieve the effects which have been uh, tested in animals. In patients, we have a large trial uh, which was done by Martin Ress and Alexandre de Moule, uh, but not at the initial phase. They, they started the, um, for, for different reasons, they started the approach at the time of uh, weaning in patients difficult to wean from the ventilator. They couldn't show an effect on the weaning duration, but they did show an effect on the, um, the force of the diaphragm tested by the maximum inspiratory pressure. So again, saying, well, you, ca you can really train the diaphragm even, uh, even later on during the course of mechanical ventilation. So where are we now? We have a number of techniques which can potentially be used in, in critically ill patients to stimulate the diaphragm. Uh, you have, let's say, invasive technique, even uh, in the ICU we are used to be invasive, but uh, where you know, there are surgically implemented uh, uh, electrical stimulation of the diaphragm for patients with spinal cord injury, for instance. Uh, we have now this minimally invasive technique, let's say, with the catheter, where you can stimulate continuously or maybe half of the time. Um, I think it's interesting to also have non-invasive technique uh, for, for various reasons I, I will discuss. And this uh, stimulation of the phrenic nerve can be done non-invasively non uh, either by electrical stimulation or by electromagnetic stimulation. And this last one is, is really interesting because it's uh, the way we test the diaphragm when we do uh, phrenic uh, nerve stimulation for measuring the force of the diaphragm. This is what we use. Um, so we have been interested by this uh, new non-invasive magnetic stimulator and uh, I'm going to show you some uh, preliminary data which uh, uh, illustrate how potentially it could be used. So um, these are coils which have been adapted to be put at the neck of the patient in the uh, anterior part of the neck to stimulate the phrenic nerve. This first study was done by uh, um, uh, Alessandro Panelli and Stefan Schaller in uh, Berlin. And it's just to show that uh, in the operating room, if you do stimulation of the phrenic nerve with the coils, you get a tidal volume. So you, you're able to, um, to stimulate the phrenic nerve. They just recently uh, published another paper in chest which uh, showed that it's also feasible in ICU patients. What's interesting with this technique is that um, you don't have to do it, you cannot do it continuously, but you, you can do it intermittently with a relative good control of the intensity. And I'd like to show you uh, some of the data we obtained in an animal study with lung injury. Why an animal study in lung injury if we want just to show that we can stimulate the phrenic nerve? Because this is the situation where we would use it. This is a situation or where you have inflammation, and uh, this is a situation where um, you, you may have uh, uh, no activity of the diaphragm because of the sedation for, for several days. So, so we did a study in animals where we compared the control group, where we, we are supposed to see maybe a diaphragm atrophy. Um, a group where the stimulation is done every uh, uh, eight hours, and a group where the stimulation is done every four hours. So we just do intermittent period of stimulation, uh, 15 minutes every four or six hours, and uh, maybe just to wake up the diaphragm and to avoid hibernation, I don't know. So this is the kind of uh, tracing, again, you, you can see. Uh, it was synchronized with mechanical ventilation. And uh, you, you, you see that you can uh, control the uh, 
intensity and the duration of the stimulation to, to be uh, sure that you avoid uh, stimulating during expiration, for instance, as we heard before. And uh, that's the two main results we obtained. Um, the first result, which we, we did not completely expect, but which is in line with I, what I presented before, is when we look at lung volume. Um, again, this is an animal model with lung injury. This is, these animals were monitored with the uh, um, electrical impedance tomography. And in the group which is non-stimulated, there is a huge decrease in lung volume over time. And this decrease in lung volume, even with intermittent periods, short periods of stimulation, this decrease in lung volume is, is avoided with uh, stimulation. So again, stimulating the phrenic nerve looks very good for the lung. And then we look at the diaphragm. Uh, when we look at the change in uh, PDI twitch, uh, we saw a benefit of uh, stimulation. However, it is well known that the twitch is influenced by lung volume. So we did additional experiments to uh, express the change in, in, in the diaphragm uh, force corrected for the change in lung volume. Because when you have lower lung volume, you expect a higher force of the diaphragm. And when we do that, uh, we could see that there is a, a strong effect of the stimulation. And again, it's inter short term intermittent stimulation on the force of the diaphragm, especially with the more frequent stimulation, but there is also some effect with the more distant stimulation every eight hours. So very encouraging result, uh, suggesting that today, if, sorry, even if there are many unanswered questions, we see that phrenic nerve stimulation um, is not only interesting for the diaphragm, we have very promising experimental data. It's an early clinical stage. Uh, there is two approaches, invasive, non-invasive, and the non-invasive is probably um, much more intermittent and small periods of, of, of uh, stimulation. Uh, so we need more data and more trials to see what uh, approach will be the most uh, promising for our patients. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Laurent. Questions from the audience? Mm, I have a question. How is the situation of the lung and diaphragm after this, you stop the stimulation? Because this is our problem when we work the several, several, several years ago. Uh, trying to stimulate diaphragm in different mm -hmm. other situations. And uh, when we stopped things, uh, you know, you don't have a, a good recover. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion about that? Well, it, you know, it's, it's a specific lung, model, lung injury model, right? So we have to be careful. We, but that's why I did not expect such a huge difference in lung volume by only doing short periods of stimulation. Mm -hmm. It was... And even in the control group, we had repeated recruitment maneuvers. The recruitment maneuvers did not maintain lung volume. Yeah. While these short period of simulations were sufficient to maintain lung volume, in the group where lung uh, stimulation was, uh, was more distant, there was some drop in lung volume. So the one with stimulation every three or four hours you, we maintain lung volume. Again, it may be more specific to the lung injury model. I think we need to repeat that, but that was very encouraging if you think yeah. of just short period of intermittent, uh, intermittent periods of uh, mm -hmm. stimulation. And do you think that the amplitude of stimulation should be the, the main target, you know, rather than the, the frequency? Well, I, I was very concerned by not stimulating too much. So we, we were, and for instance, we are using occlusion to, to, to target uh, muscular pressure, and we were more on the lower side because uh, it's very easy to stimulate very intensely. So 
it depends on the patient, on the neck, on the anatomic position, but sometimes I don't think we should uh, stimulate at uh, supramaximal frequency for mm -hmm. 15 minutes. You, you would make major injury. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yes, the amplitude is very important, especially to be, to be on the safe side. Excellent. Questions? No? Thank you very much. Thank Have you. a good flight back home. Uh, thank you so much, Ron. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the last speaker for the session. Uh, as you saw, the last uh, two were, were uh, switched to accommodate travel schedules. Uh, um, so uh, Dr. Alexandre Demoul uh, from uh, uh, Paris, uh, France, uh, is here to talk uh, uh, further about the potential role for neurostimulation um, to uh, uh, manage diaphragm dysfunction. Thank you so much for... Uh, thank you. Thank us. you very much. So, um, so this talk will be on uh, the history and, and of phrenic nerve stimulation and, and the clinical application uh, today. These are my, my disclosures. Uh, uh, so generally, uh, mechanical ventilation so related to all my talks, especially here. Uh, I have received grants and, and consulting fees from uh, Lung Pacer, uh, which is uh, one of the manufacturers of a device I will talk about. So, diaphragm neurostimulation is, is a story uh, that started 30 years ago at, at the, the early 90s, was the last century. And, and it was the first was um, permanent diaphragm neurostimulation, and it was built to win from mechanical ventilation patient with central respiratory paralysis. So, let's remember that, that or, uh, the, automatic, uh, the, the automatic drive, uh, the respiratory drive to the diaphragm is generated in, in the brainstem by, by centers and, and travels through the spinal cord to the roots of the phrenic nerves, which are located in, in C4. And when there is a damage of uh, the, either uh, the respiratory centers in the brain stem or a section of the spinal cord at a level that is over C4, the, there is no more respiratory drive that is uh, transmitted to the phrenic nerve. So that could be caused uh, acquired, so um, a damage caused to the, 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 the centers in the brainstem by a stroke or, or TBI. It could be congenital disease, the Ondin disease, but the vast majority is caused by a high cervical spinal cord injury uh, in, in C4, over C4. So, when, when uh, given the fact, and it's absolutely necessary, that the phrenic nerves are, are still working, it's possible to paste them and to restore uh, a contraction of the diaphragm and to wean patients from the ventilator. So, there's two techniques for this. Uh, the, the, the first technique is to um, put intrathoracic electrodes around the phrenic nerves. So it works like this. It uh, requires a mini thoracotomy. And you see how the surgeon in, is placing electrodes around the phrenic nerves. It's quite tricky, difficult, because there is a risk of phrenic nerve injury. And more recently, a second technique has been developed which consists in placing electrodes within the diaphragm, but very close to uh, the termination of the phrenic nerves, and it can be done by laparoscopy. So, this works pretty well to restore uh, the uh, diaphragm activity in uh, those quad patients with quad quadriplegia, sorry. And it st studies have shown that it improves also blood gases in these patients, but globally, 
the good, the, there is two valid indications, central respiratory paralysis and, and central hypoventilation. I would say it's pretty much the same. So the good results, first, we can win patients from mechanical ventilation. Second, all the studies shows that there's an improvement in quality of life with a gain in mobility. Uh, patients feel more secure that connected to the ventilator. And there's a gain, for instance, olfaction is back, uh, which is always very pleasant. It reduces infections and the cost uh, there, there's a benefit in terms of costs over uh, chronic mechanical ventilation. But it concerns, for instance, in France, at maximum 50 patients per year. But in terms of, uh, of uh, quality uh, of life, this is one of our patients. Uh, and uh, you see, like, uh, doing some parachute in tandem and with, with the phrenic nerve stimulator. And so, so, the indication was winning patient with tetraplegia from mechanical ventilation. And, and it was a permanent stimulation. And then we discover ventilator-induced diaphragm weakness. So it was 15 years ago. And as soon as we discovered ventilator-induced diaphragm weakness, then we start thinking, how? How could we gain diaphragm strength? How could we treat and cure this weak diaphragm and restore some diaphragm strength? And then there's, if we want to restore some diaphragm strength, we need some diaphragm contraction. It's, you know, it's, diaphragm has to go to the, to the gym. And if my, there's three different situations. If my patient can fully participate and contribute to ventilation, fully contribute, then we could use inspiratory muscle training. If my, if my patient cannot um, generate a volitional contraction of the diaphragm, it's not possible to do inspiratory muscle training, but if my patient can sustain pressure support ventilation, you can use proportional mode, but even with pressure support ventilation, you can train the diaphragm. But if my patient does not trigger uh, the ventilator, or if my patient triggers the ventilator, as we can see, we can use diaphragm neurostimulation to generate diaphragm contraction without diaphragm spontaneous activity. So Laurent Bochard showed this uh, picture first, but here is the concept. Uh, in a normal breathing, the, um, the, the normal breathing is achieved by a contraction of, of inspiratory muscles uh, in positive pressure ventilation. This is the ventilator that generates this pressure. And here we're going to combine both. There will be some pressure generated by the ventilator, but also we will restore some diaphragm contractile activity uh, with uh, the stimulator. And this is the concept of temporary diaphragm neurostimulation, because of course this stimulation should be given only for a short period of time, between, which is winning the patient from the ventilator or help winning the patient from the ventilator or prevents uh, the uh, constitution of diaphragm weakness in a mechanically ventilated patient. So this has to be temporary. So there's various techniques, and Laurent Brochard exposed these uh, different techniques. The first one that was developed is uh, the catheter. So it's, it's, it's a central venous line that has to be inserted in the uh, left uh, subclavian uh, vein, and it's equipped with electrodes and there's, there's two sets of electrodes, and you see that, you see that when the, when, uh, sorry. So when the uh, catheter is in place, you see that there's sets of electrodes in front of the left phrenic nerves and in front of the right phrenic nerves. So this achieves 
schizophrenic nerves contractions. And first, we had animal data in, in pigs by, by the group of uh, Vancouver. So they uh, randomized 18 uh, pigs to receive either um, so mechanical ventilation with uh, no um, pacing and mechanical ventilation with phrenic pacing and no mechanical ventilation, no pacing, to, to pure control. And in the group with phrenic pacing, there was, uh, um, the diaphragm was stimulated every second breath and it lasted 60 hours. So here is a, uh, how it looked like. So we have airway pressures, it was it's controlled mechanical ventilation. And what interests us is here we have transdiaphragmatic pressure and, and diaphragm EMG. And you see that we have two completely different shapes of, of pressure, of airway pressure traces. Uh, we have the traces when the non-stimulated airway pressure cycles, non-stimulated cycles, and when the cycle is, is stimulated here. So the uh, peak airway pressure is decreased because at the same moment we have uh, an activation of the diaphragm with some transdiaphragmatic pressure that is generated. So the catheter stimulates the diaphragm, so you see the EMG, and generates transdiaphragmatic pressure, uh, and you can see those cycles here. So, uh, in, this, uh, in this study, um, we, the, 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 here is the, the, the pathology. So you have the, the control group, no ventilation, no pacing, so pigs were breathing. And, and there's no atrophy. And in the group who received the mechanical ventilation with no pacing, you can see some myofibers atrophy. And in the group of pigs, uh, who uh, received mechanical ventilation plus pacing, you see that, I uh, shouldn't say no atrophy, but, but it prevents uh, atrophy. In, in, in terms of, uh, sorry, in terms of uh, myofiber size, you see that there's an effect uh, on myofiber size. This is the control group, no, um, no ventilation, no pacing, and you see that there's a reduction in the cross-sectional area of diaphragm myofibers when there is only mechanical ventilation, but with spacing, this decrease in uh, the cross-sectional area of diaphragm myofibers is, is partly uh, prevented. So uh, we, we try uh, to apply this technique to, to patients and, and we performed a, a multi-center uh, study, uh, including 110 difficult to win patients. And, and this is the important point. So the technique was started very late. The patient had to fail at least one um, spontaneous breathing trial uh, due to respiratory muscle weakness. So they were very severely weak in terms of diaphragm uh, strength. And, and the trial, the, the, the primary outcome was to uh, improve. So it was successful winning. And you see that there was no difference between the two groups in terms of successful winning. Uh, one of the secondary outcome was the change in, um, in maximum expiratory pressure. And there was a difference that uh, in the, the patient in the catheter group, the patient who uh, undergone um, phrenic nerve stimulation had a higher uh, change in, uh, in maximum uh, inspiratory uh, pressure, suggesting that, that the, the diaphragm has gained in terms of uh, strength. So more recently, the, the, the Trono group, and, and you and Goliger shows you uh, this uh, strategy developed the concept of on-demand stimulation, but I will not expand on those data that, that you and Goliger has uh, exposed uh, deeply. So, um, in my conclusion and, and take-home messages regarding diaphragm neurostimulation, so uh, 
permanent diaphragm neurostimulation uh, that we call, we used to call phrenic pacing, uh, is clearly works to win for mechanical ventilation patients with central respiratory paralysis, so patients with tetraplegia in general. It improves quality of life and it's uh, safe, but it's a limited number of patients. So now for uh, ICU patients to prevent or reverse ventilator induced diaphragm dysfunction, we have temporary diaphragm stimulation, which seems to improve diaphragm muscle strength. But today we have no evidence for uh, faster winning. Uh, the data I showed was what were with the central venous catheter. So there are new technique emerging. But I think that today there's two important questions. When should we start? And what should be the dose of neurostimulation that we give to patients? Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, any questions from the audience? Um, or if, I, if I may ask one, uh, I think putting together this, this whole session, uh, I, I find the phrase that uh, you use, uh, neurostimulation, to be quite intriguing. Uh, because uh, based on both both uh, the transcutaneous electromagnetic device that uh, Laurent touched on and uh, the intravascular device you've talked about, um, I guess I wonder whether it's just the diaphragm nerve that we're stimulating. And linking that back to uh, Dr. Hunk's talk at the beginning, um, you know, if the vagus nerve, for instance, takes a similar course, there's actually quite a robust literature. Um, in like the rheumatology world and autoimmune disease around vagal stimulation having direct anti-inflammatory effects. And so I wonder if as we think about the potential roles for neurostimulation, not just diaphragm stimulation, um, uh, whether there might actually be other nerves that we're stimulating that have other uh, beneficial organ protective effects. Yes, that, that's a great question. And this is possibly uh, what uh, explains the results that Laurent Brochard showed on diaphragm neuro the impact of diaphragm neurostimulation on the brain. That could be explained by a vagal stimulation. So there's, there's potential effect of neurostimulation beyond the diaphragm itself. Sure. Do you know, uh, just one quick follow-up, and sorry, uh, I'll let you ask. Uh, is, uh, have you looked in your studies, or, or do you know if others have ever looked at, uh, for instance, evidence of vagal tone in patients undergoing stimulation? I wonder no, if might be no, no, we haven't. We haven't. Uh, but, but we have ongoing uh, research on the, uh, on, on the impact of uh, diaphragm neurostimulation on the EEG signal mm -hmm. with extensive EEG signal analysis in, uh, in patients. Excellent. That's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hunks. But it's great talk. Um, I know you're involved in a study evaluating the effects of expiratory muscle stimulation as well, right? So from a clinical perspective, what do you think makes the most sense? Should we focus on the diaphragm or the expiratory muscles, especially because if we look at reasons for extubation failure, it's quite often inadequate cough strength. Patients are not able to maintain airway clearance. So from that perspective, maybe the expiratory muscle stimulation. No, you're totally right. I, I had to, move to make some choices in my presentation. And, and it's, it's thank you for this question. Um, my personal view is that to get wind from the ventilator, is, I mean, to breathe without the assistance of the ventilator, we need the diaphragm. So, so here is where we need the diaphragm. But after, this is only the first step. The second step is we remove the tube and then the patient is on his or her own. And here, we need the abdominal muscles because we need the good, the good calf. And here is where this abdominal uh, muscle stimulation is, is, could be very, very efficient. Because, you know, if we just target uh, succeeding the SBT, this is not enough. What we want is to remove the tube. And, and the fact is uh, the devices to stimulate abdominal muscles are more friendly user 
that the device is to stimulate the diaphragm because stimulating the diaphragm is very complex. I mean, the, the phrenic nerves, they are really in depth of the neck. So all those stimulators, even the magnetic one, it's a big thing like this. Uh, for, the, for the abdominal muscle, it's just two small uh, patches of, of electrodes, very simple, like uh, the thing, you know, it's, it's very easy. So yes, I think that the two techniques are, are complementary, uh, but we cannot have, com uh, as have, we cannot have one target, which is to win the patient. We have another target, which is to extubate the patient. And another target to make sure that the patient can walk afterwards. So we also need electrical stimulation of yes. the peripheral the, muscles. The whole body. We need a suit. Yeah. Uh, Alexander, congratulations. Thank fantastic you very talk. Much. Fantastic. No, no, I have a question. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, we have one minute. One minute. Uh, you are here. Uh, I was a little bit surprised when I saw your curves showing that the resistive component after the stimulation seems to be much more important than the last component. How do you explain it? Because you have a, a higher peak pressure showing that the, the flow increased as well as the resistive. No, it's not, it's not like this. It's, it's just because that it's volume control. So, yes. so uh, it, it just decreased the whole pressure. And uh, it's difficult to see whether, you know, if it's the resistive or the elastic, because it, it decreases everything. This oh. is my personal view. Yeah, okay. So, thank you very much. Fantastic talk, thank fantastic you. job. You are doing very well, very well. So, I'd like to thank you, to thank the audience for being here.